Bible tonight, if you would, to, uh, I'd like you to open to Matthew 17. And I'm going to pick up this story in Mark 9 also, but you'll get the message here. Um, you know, every one of you, uh, if you've been saved a moment, amen, or if you get saved tonight and give your heart to Christ, you need to realize you have enough faith. Let me finish that sentence I just did, amen. You have enough. What you have needs to be worked with, amen, and needs to, you need to honor God with it. But you need to understand, uh, we look at, you know, as we uh, look at other people, uh, like my you know, brother said, when I, when I moved to San Diego, he was there pioneering a church, had a church pretty much established and moving along. And I thought, what great faith, man, because I hadn't seen that yet in my ministry, but I, I loved it. I saw that we used to take our church over, visit when we started pioneering, and any chance we could connect with their church. And... Uh, and I thought, you know, I need faith like that. And I thought, I need faith like Pastor Mitchell. He's got faith. I need faith like so-and-so. They got faith. I need, you know, I want to tell you, you have enough faith. And, you know, we have enough in us. Jesus said, if you have just a little bit, you can move a mountain. I preached a sermon not long ago. And uh, sure enough, a guy in my church, you know, I used that text quite a bit in that sermon. And uh, he He's a bit of a cynical sort, and all he had to say when I was done preaching was, where in the Bible did Jesus ever move a mountain? I said, almost every day, he moved them out of people's ways. You're going to hit some obstacles and some tests in life, and they're going to be mountain-sized. Amen. And you have the faith that it takes to get through there. And so I want to help us with this tonight. I feel God will. Amen. In Matthew 17, a man had a son. Uh, very severely handicapped and demon-possessed on top of it, epilepsy, epilepsy and some other issues. And so he'd spent a lifetime with this boy. Now the boy is a, a teenager, and we have every reason to believe he might be, you know, 15, 16, something like that, maybe even older. But that's a lifetime uh, for them. When you have a son like that, in, back in those days in particular, it means he has your constant attention. It's daily. It's, and it's all day. Someone has to be with him because that's how he will live. Yeah, if you're not, I mean, you know, he has a fit, he chokes, he gets tossed in the fire or in the water, he drowns, he gets burnt. So someone's constantly wrapped up with him. You know, that, that can tax your life a little bit. So this guy brings the boy to Jesus' disciples who failed to get him healed. And so when Jesus comes on the scene, there's a bunch of religious people that are ready to mock everything that's going on, and there's issues, you know. And Jesus comes on and says, uh, uh, what's going on? And uh, the, the man runs right to him. And we could pick this up in Matthew 17. The father of the boy comes to him. And the Bible says in 17, when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, because he's an epileptic. He suffers severely. He often falls into the fire. He often falls into the water. And so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. The child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, and they said, and we got to catch this tonight. This is very important. They said, why couldn't we do this? Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, that's a, that's a uh, you know, he rebukes them, number one, when he comes on the scene, and they have the, they have the wherewithal to ask, how come we couldn't do it? I think that's where we fall short sometimes. If things just don't happen, they just don't happen. We move along. I want to tell you, we need faith that prevails. Faith that persists. Faith that pursues. And here they are. They're not settling for, you know, you know, this guy just doesn't have the faith or we don't know, you know. They want to know, why didn't this happen? Why couldn't we get the job done? It's a good question. I have to ask that sometimes myself. I want to know. Because I want to make progress and I want to continue on this walk and I want to see God glorified and I want to see the work of God done. And that's what they said. Why 
And Jesus rebukes them in the midst of this. Uh, his rebuke is intense. He calls him a faithless and perverse generation. The word perverse there doesn't quite mean the same thing we think of today. We think of somebody that's perverted, some the issues that are perverted, porn and these different issues. What he's saying there, this word tends to uh, lends itself to a meaning of you just, you just can't go straight very long. You're off to the side. You turn this way, you turn that. That's what happens to a lot of people with their faith. It doesn't quite work like they thought, and it's not long before they're going a different direction. They're just going off to the side. That's the perverseness that he's speaking about. And he says, you guys got this faith. You stepped up to the task, but then it didn't happen. And, you know, this is a problem with a lot of people. It just didn't happen. Have you ever spoke to someone on an outreach? Someone at work, someone you begin to witness to, and they begin to tell you, yeah, I, I, I believed before. You know, I went to church before. I tried God. Have you ever heard that from people? And what they're saying is, they made this move. <laughs> they just diverted. They did try. Maybe they did. Maybe they started on the right path. Maybe God helped them. But when things didn't pan out the way they wanted, they were quick to turn another way. So this is very interesting. This guy is consumed with this boy. Oftentimes, he said, he cast this boy into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. The father said to him, actually, Mark records in Mark 9, 22, so if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And that's where Jesus said to the man, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said, cried out with tears. He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He got it. He's, he's new. He's not, he's not one of the disciples. They've been with Jesus for a while at this point. But he's, he just says, I, I do believe, but it's this, I've, not, I've never seen results. Jesus said, if you can believe, anything is possible. How many of you know with God, the things that are impossible with man, they're possible with God. There's nothing that God can't do. And I want to bring some encouragement this first night of revival and help us with this because we all come up against this. And the number one reason I think that it is is because if you have come to Christ, you're look, looking like this man, you're looking for some big help, right? I mean, the saving of our soul was no small feat. That's big. I didn't believe you could save my soul. I was that dark. That's where I had ended up in life, in my life of sin. It was, you know, I just didn't believe that there was salvation for someone like me. I, I knew there was religion. I believed there's a God, but I didn't want to even hear about him talk about him, know about him. I just thought I was gone in my sin. And it was big for me to get saved. It was huge. And for you. Then we come up against other things. And we see what we see is God demonstrates power in Christianity. We'll see that. When you got saved, that was powerful. I prayed with a young man. I didn't pray with him. I was in my church just the other day. He gets saved and immediately says, boy, do I feel different said, it worked, hallelujah. You got it. You should. Had a young man come uh, about his third week in church and tell me after church one day, he said, Pastor, I, I'm not sure, but I think I'm doing something wrong. I said, why is that? He goes, going to work now is like going to war. I said, I think you're probably doing something right. He goes to his shop. He's a Marine. He goes wherever he works. He shows up, man, and the guy's, you know, he's, he's changed. He doesn't talk like they talk. He's not going where they went. Amen. His heart has changed. He's wanting God. There's some holiness in his life, a separation from his sin. And all of a sudden, it's like a war. But am I doing things right? I said, you're probably more right than you know. You know, what's happened to him is God got involved. And Christianity is always a demonstration of God's power in men's lives, men and women. It's God doing the impossible. That's why this guy came to Jesus. He said, I've got a need, man. It's been a lifetime of this. We're consumed with this. The boy, this thing's trying to destroy our son. You know, when you lived in those Bible days, when it was cold, there were fires. <laughs> That's the heat. 
You go to the market, you walk down the street, you stop at the courtyard, the neighbor's place, you know, where the house is, there's fires everywhere. And, you know, this thing, toss the boy in the fire. Someone's got to watch him. If you're by the water, they're by Galilee. Where do you think that is? It's a lake. It's going to toss him in. This dad is saying, I got a huge need, and he's looking for power, and he came to the right place. Because Jesus Christ, every day he walked the earth, he demonstrated God's power for men. What a beautiful thing, because we're sunk without it. Jesus demonstrated it daily from the inception of his earthly ministry. Luke 4, he stands up and reads the scriptures in the temple. You remember the story? It's the first time we read about him speaking to the religious people there. And he reads out of Isaiah and he tells them, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, Set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Many of the people that were there, no doubt, were familiar with that prophecy. But who's going to do all that? He said, I'm here to do it. This is what Christianity is. Things happen when God gets moving. So we come in and we get saved. Immediately, God begins to demonstrate some power. Jesus went throughout all of Galilee. Matthew 4.23 says, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Have you read that in your Bible? He healed them all. Not some, not sometimes, but all. Acts 10, 38, the preacher's reminding the folks who Jesus is, and he says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, and he went about doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was, like, was with him. And the disciples were sent to do likewise. Remember, Jesus sent them out. He, he commanded them even after he, he's leaving, you know, and he's about to descend, ascend into heaven. And he says, now go, preach it everywhere. Heal the sick, cast out devils. You have power. Get this done. Well, yeah, but you say those are a special bunch. Those are the apostles, the disciples. Do you know they were probably as simple as every one of us were before, maybe even more so. Those guys weren't traveling the world. They, don't, they didn't go far. They were probably never any further than with about a 40-mile radius of the place of their birth. They never went and saw the world. They didn't have education. They, the, the book of Acts, they comment on these guys right away and say, they were ignorant and unlearned, man. Where did they get this? What do they got? They knew Jesus. And his power was evident in their lives. They were simpletons in that respect, you know, but they were transformed. And they had that power that Jesus promised would come upon him. And so, I mean, even in the book of Acts, you know, at the very beginning, the first chapter, they're still in the mindset that, you know, we don't quite get it. They, remember, they're asking Jesus, you know, when's the return? You know, when's your power come? When's the kingdom? So Jesus says, guys, 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 please just go get filled with the Holy Ghost. That's paraphrased, but it's kind of what he said. He says, you'll figure this out, and you'll have power when the Holy Ghost. Now, here's these guys. They've never been anywhere. they never seen this power except in him. And when he had them, sent them out, they prayed for some folks. They've seen some things, but now he's leaving them. He's going to heaven. You know, that very mo moment, just moments after that, they watch him ascend up on a cloud. He's gone. But they get filled with the Holy Ghost, and Peter preaches that day. And 3,000 people get saved. Something happened big time. Power is beginning to be exhibited in their lives. I'll tell you, when we get saved, we begin to see this around us. We see it in our lives. We see things happen. I had no power to change my life. I had no intention. Even when I got saved, I thought this was great, but what am I going to do? They won't let me go to church here. That's true. I'm going to preach a little on my testimony. I'll save it for tomorrow. It was true, amen. And my wife agreed with me, amen. <laughs> she knew me pretty good. She said, you're right. I'm not going to do too good here. Not you. I'll tell you, God has the power to change things. We don't even think can be changed. He healed so many. People would come to Jesus and just touch the hem of his garment. See, I'd read about that later. Oh, the Bible says multitudes did that. P 
Peter began to just have a ministry in the book of Acts, his very shadow would touch people. He, he could pray for miracles. This is the God we serve, and this is what his Christianity is. It's a demonstration of his power in men. You. You and I. Not special people. Amen. I love Pastor Mitchell. He, he helped us so much with understanding God can use any one of us. If you've ever been to any of the crusades he did, he'd always say this in a crusade. Any one of you can do what I'm doing. Pray for someone. See someone healed. See a miracle. Power. Lady came up, touched Jesus that one time. Jesus knew, Mark 5, 30, he knew something happened. She, this big crowd of people all around and people touching him everywhere. But all of a sudden, this woman, in an act of faith, reached through and just touched him and got healed. And Jesus knew that something happened because he said he understood that virtue came forth from him. Virtue is his power. It's power. It's strength. It's the power to make miracles happen. It's a holy power. It's a dynamic of God moving. And this power is to dwell in you and I. Not just them, right? We, how many of you can use a little more power? Amen. God has all we need. Well, then I don't have enough faith. Yes, you do. You, you, you don't have that much? You do. How'd you get saved? By faith. It puts you in the running with this whole thing. Amen. And if that spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I mean, God is into this. That's Romans 8, 11. God says this is our promise. This power, this spirit, it's to dwell in us. He's to dwell in us. This power is to be ours. Listen, you know, I'm getting older. I've concluded. Amen. <laughs> getting there. Well into middle age. Little grandson of mine, beautiful kid, man. Just turned 10. He's a loving kid, great. And he's at the house the other day, and I went to throw the football to him. I said, oh, one time. I said, whoops, that arm don't do that no more. And I'm not a, he says, we're done. That's a pretty good pass, wasn't it? Oh, man, my shoulder's hurting me. My wrist is killing me. He says, that's okay, Gramps. He, says, he, he comes up. He's got his hand up like this. We're walking across the yard. He says, you know, for an old guy, though, you got a lot of energy. And uh, I said, you know, I said, that's a riot. And he goes, well, no, you do, Gramps. I said, that's a riot. I don't. He goes, yeah. I, he said, Grandpa, I said, for an old guy. I said, well, he, oh, it's a compliment, amen. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, I guess for an old guy, I'm still breathing and walking pretty good, amen. And yep, praise God. But I have the power of God. It's a beautiful thing to wake up every day and know that you know him and have his evidence of him being in your life. And this is something very personal, something very wonderful and the writer Paul of the book of Ephesians, he, he's praying. He's Part of the book of Ephesians is a prayer. And in chapter 1, verse 17, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom, revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint. He's saying, I am praying that you would understand this isn't just Christian religion as usual. That what you have in Christ, some understanding can be yours. The hope, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named. He's saying, this is who Jesus is, and in him you have access to something far greater than who we are by ourselves, in and in ourselves. This same power is ours. 
this same wonder. Our names are written in heaven already. They're in a high place. We have a power that goes way beyond us. Will we use that? Will we utilize it? Will we walk in that? And it, we have it so we can glorify God in his work on the earth today, where we are. I got a guy in my church. God bless this young man. Basically, every week, and I have to, let me just, let's just say every two weeks since he's been saved, it's been months, he brings a new convert to church. Someone that gets converted. He, he, he gets them saved. It's not one of those guys that just, he knows how to corner people on an outreach and make them pray, amen. Yeah. <laughs> Come back, I got one today, Pastor. I pray to get rid of you, amen. But, uh, now, this guy, he brings him to church. I met a guy Sunday, uh, Sunday morning, got saved at our altar, on Wednesday night, right at our altar. We brought him out first time every week, just about. So, I mean, because sometimes he brings three. <laughs> he, is, he never stops talking about the Jesus that changed his life. He, he believes, and he's shaking our base, man. He's bringing so much fruit. It's unbelievable. You believe, and you and I believe. This guy, when he got saved, he had never thought ever of having a public discussion about God with anyone. Raised in an Orthodox family, you know, had a fear of God, but not saved, never been converted. Had a very, fear, very fearful of God. He's scared to death of God. No power in his life, no relationship with God, but he gets saved, and all of a sudden, uh, it took a little while, the fellow working with him on base, it took a little while, but when boldness kicked in, man, you can't stop him from engaging people. And he's bringing so much fruit to God through the power of God that has changed his life. Now you say, well, I haven't brought anybody to church in a long time. Well, I, I haven't either. But I'm not going to quit. And I'm going to keep talking about Jesus. I'm going to keep witnessing and praying with people and believing. And may, we'll make a difference for people. We'll make a difference. See, what happens when we don't see the fruit, you know, someone come in, fruitfulness. We don't see the miracle we prayed for. We don't see family members. You know, when I got saved, I thought my family would be thrilled. Because they were as dysfunctional as I was. I thought, man, it's a lifeline, man. You know, only to find out not one of them was pleased. Oh, man. My father disowned me twice. He, he was a mess. A mess. I mean, a certifiable mess. But he, now I'm, I'm a mess. Worse than, I was a real mess, amen. And they all, we all got along great. Till I got saved. And I thought, what happened to me is going to, they're going to want this. Who wouldn't want this? And I got very discouraged. I thought, surely, this would be, I would see this happen. These disciples, grant, I'll grant, guarantee you, they prayed for that young boy because they believed this was going to happen. That's why they prayed. It didn't happen. The religious people are mocking them. The Pharisees are out to the side, you know, haranguing them, wanting to talk about this. You know, you're Jesus' disciple, look what's happening. But you know, the father is still so broken. When Jesus shows up, he throws himself at his feet and says, if you can help me, help me. And Jesus simply says, if you can believe. And he heals the boy. And then the disciples have the wherewithal not to say, you know, I was going to talk to you about that, Jesus. I didn't think this guy really believed. You know, I don't think John had anything to do with, you know, if John would have had some faith, we could have made this happen, you know. Maybe it was Peter, I don't know, but, you know. No, no, no. They, you know what they said? Why couldn't we do it? What do a lot of people do when they don't see the fruit they want, when they don't see the, the, the power of God demonstrated, when they don't see their own miracles they need, or someone else, what do they do? They, the crooked and perverseness just begin to go this way, they Discouragement takes them some other place. We can get a lot of trouble if we live under the cloud of discouragement. It's very dangerous. We turn elsewhere. We look, we look for who to blame. Sometimes husbands blame wives. Wives blame husbands. That's why this isn't working. That's why we don't see anything. That's why nothing good happens. That's why we don't have money. That's why this, why that. 
We get frustrated. What people do when they get frustrated? Go watch TV. Go get drunk. They go do, make money. They go do something. They shift their doctrinal views. All of a sudden, you know, I can believe in God and just do it my way. It's very sad because it moves people away when all the while Jesus said the issue is if you have a little faith, you can move those big, bad obstacles, the mountain. These guys focused on themselves. You know, why couldn't we do this? It's not, you know, I'm frustrated, I quit, I'm out of here. No, they said, I, I, you know, I, I'm not going to quit. It's not like, well, it doesn't work for me, I'll just be a church guy, I'll just show up. No, they said, why can't I get it done? Now, what good is it for me to witness? Nobody ever gets saved. Change your outlook on that. Change your mindset. What about tithe? I've been tithing a week now, and I didn't get anything back. You know, that's <laughs> tithe, tithe. Honor God with what belongs to God. So learn to be generous. Learn to have faith to believe. Went on outreach. Didn't pray with anyone. Prayed for a sick guy. They got sicker. Well, don't stop. God, what about me? How come this isn't working? Listen, I've prayed many times that prayer. What about me, God? Prayed at the altar, prayed in my prayer room, my, my house, prayed at the prayer room at church, prayed, prayed in my car. God, you got to do more than I'm seeing. Amen. And some folks just decide, I'll just be a mediocre Christian, I'll be a mediocre husband, I'll be, a, you know, it's all I'm going to be, and I'll just be what I'm going to. You know, we're not asking. You, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to say you need to be some kind of superstar Christian. I'm saying, where is the power of God? We need it. Every one of us. But the issue is, like when Jesus came on the scene and he, they asked him why, he gave them an answer. He said, it's your unbelief. Can we deal with that answer? Because the onus is on us. It, my problems with this were not the church... <coughs> It wasn't my pastor, it wasn't my wife. It wasn't my unbelieving congregation. It was me. The onus is on us. That's the saying, you know. That's what Jesus tells them. And he uses the, uh, the, the mountain moving issue, the hyperbole, you know, of moving a mountain. You know, where, he, where they are in Galilee, let me tell you something. If you're down there by the, the water, everything's a mountain. If everything goes up from there. So no doubt... Standing there, it's real easy to see this big looming mountain sticking up there. Maybe they're not like our Rockies or something, but I mean, you're looking at a big dark hill there. Sometimes in life, the thing overshadowing you, it looks like a mountain, doesn't it? It's big. It's been there a long time. I never get over it. I'm trying to find a way around it. I'm living. Sometimes Christians just live in the shadow of the mountain. Yet Jesus said, if you had just a little bit of faith, you could move it. That's the mountain he's talking about. Not a physical mountain. When that boy's father spoke, couldn't you hear it in his voice? This is my son, man. And this demon's trying to destroy him. That's big. That's a mountain to him. Can't do nothing with it. Have mercy. I wonder where else he's turned. I wonder how much help he sought. How about the woman? 12 years, you know, with the issue of blood. She spent everything. She's living in the shadow of this thing, man, constantly, constantly. And she breaks through and just touches Jesus. Jesus spoke to them. I brought them to your disciples, Matthew 17, 16 says, but they couldn't do it. Jesus answered and said, faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? It's almost like he's saying, I don't want to put up with this anymore. But he's, he's just kind of making a point. But look, you guys got to get this. He rebuked it, the demon, and the child was cured immediately. So it, it was a faith problem. Jesus said, if you had faith, you could do this. I, I, you know, these guys now, they've been with Jesus a while. They're, they're probably about at the three-year mark when you get to this point in the ministry of Christ. They're not rookies. 
They're committed men. They're, they're at the point, this is when, this, during this time frame, is when Peter says, you know, we've given everything up to follow you. We're on. We're in this. But we're not getting the results. Because they knew Christianity is a religion of the true power of God demonstrated in people's lives. Amen. How many of you had religion before and never seen any power? I was raised a Catholic, you know, and uh, we never thought about power. No. What do you need power for? Everyone does what we do. We're all sinners. <laughs> we were good sinners. <laughs> Excellent, you know. I had an uncle, man. I loved this guy. He was the most upright Christian for about 30 minutes once a week. <laughs> he wore a tie and a suit. No, I, no one else in my entire giant Catholic family ever did. But this Uncle Joe, man, he'd show up at church every Sunday morning, sleep for 30 minutes, walk out, just go right back to the most foul, <laughs> nasty man you've ever met. And this is him. It's a, he'd have his booze in the car. He wouldn't wait till he get home. He's just, you know, cigars, booze, cursing, nasty. We loved him. We were kids. Amen. <laughs> we were all sinners. Good ones. This is, a, you know, we never thought about power to change. We just, we, that's why when I finally, God's dealing with me in my early 20s, I think, ah, these guys, man, that had gotten saved around me, I worked with them. I saw their lives change. I said, I can't do that. Why would I try? I can't. Those were mountains before me. But God is the God that understands our weakness, and he has what we need. We've got to quit making excuses. There's no one else to blame. This, the onus is squarely on us. Well, I'm hoping I'm encouraging you tonight. Amen. <laughs> I mean, God wants to help us. We must have faith that prevails. Can you say amen? We've got to have it. You say, well, I was just never one to really shine. Listen, live right and you'll shine. Bring your testimony to work. Bring it to your family. Wear it. Live it. You know, we don't, we don't flaunt ourselves, you know, flaunt, you know, you know better than thou stuff. We don't do that. But we, if we're just sincere, honest people filled with God's spirit, God will demonstrate his power. If we'll believe. Heal the sick. Pray for folks. Even when it don't work, pray again. But the problem here, not that we got to get to the second part of this answer, he said, first of all, your unbelief. And if you had just this little bit of faith, you can tell the mountain to move. Another, He says, however, verse 21. We didn't read it earlier, but you have to read it in the context of this setting. However, this kind, that tough, Hard situation as doesn't come out except by fasting, and prayer and fasting. Dang. You didn't think I remember that was in there. Amen, but there we are. I'm not going to call a fast today, but, but what he's talking about is like, see, Jesus didn't come on the scene and say, what is it? Shoot, let me run. I'll be back. <laughs> fast and pray. He, he had a lifestyle of intimacy with God. You know, just setting some of the world. Prayer is a wonderful thing. Prayer is a great thing. What a, you have no greater power, weapon, weaponry on earth. Prayer. Access to God, to the throne. You know, and Jesus said, here's how this really works. This is what you, and you know what? This is something, like I said, I, I use that term over and over tonight. The onus is on us. This is something no one else can do for you. You say, wait a minute. Don't we pray for each other? Yes, we do. Don't we fast for general needs and people? Yes, we do. But I'm talking about you and what you need. I have people come to me. I've been pastoring a long time now. And, you know, I have folks come and, man, it is horrible. The pastor, they start telling me, gee whiz, yeah, that is bad. Well, why, what do I do? I said, you're going to have to believe God. That's, this is a big one, you know. I know it's a big one. That's why I told you. What do I have to do? I just told I don't. This is, God has to help you. Let me say it another way, Pastor, because you got, I want an answer. To, this is the answer. And I've offered, and this is true. So, man, you, you probably, you know what? Let's fast. Well, it's not that bad. <laughs> That's the answer I got on a number of occasions. I, and some people say, yes, let's do that. Will you help me? I say, yes. Let's seek God. Let's take a day or something, you know. Let's, 
Get serious. You want help? You want God? You want, well, it's not like you're going to make God do something by fasting or prayer. But if you have a lifestyle of sincerity before God, of seeking him, you'll be walking with him. You'll know what Paul was writing about in Ephesians 1. That's such a tremendous revelation in those words and that prayer. He's actually, the Greek terminology he uses there, he's literally coining brand new words to describe the awesomeness of this. They didn't have words for that. God in man, God putting us in heavenly places, holding us in those powerful places with him. This onus is on us. There's no shortage of God's power. Wasn't that some problems are just too big? But the issue is, why can't we do it? And God says, it just might have something to do with this intimacy you have with God in faith, believing, trusting, and in power. This is not just something other people do. I tell you, I, I, I set myself in that category probably way too long in my Christianity. You know, I'm just not a leader. I'm just not a preacher. I'm just not a, you know, I pray for the sick. Sure, I'll pray for you. you know. <laughs> no, pray believing. Pray in faith. Rise up to what God has for us. Well, it's going to take some power. Yes, God's power. And he wants to demonstrate that in our lives. So you just might need to say, as we work through this revival, a few more services together, and these messages will connect a little bit, and God will move in our hearts and lives together. But I want to tell you what he wants to do is enlarge us. That's him. That's him. That's not, well, I think I'll be a bigger and better Christian. You ain't going nowhere. He has to do this, and he will. And the mountains that shadowed you and kept you at bay, they will come down. Let's pray tonight. Let's bow our heads and do that. Let's, uh, let's call on God.